why should I care about DevOps? DevOps is ridiculously important. And remember, DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable the continuous delivery of value to our end users. Now, once again, the most important step here or point here is we need to be able to continuously deliver value. So why is it so important for us to continuously deliver value? Well, the speed of business today is so freaking fast that we have to be able to continuously deliver value to be able to keep up with the changes, with, with everything that's happening. So here's the key concept that you have to remember. If you are not implementing DevOps best practices, your competitors either have or they will. And when they do, they will absolutely out-innovate you. And this isn't just DevOps theory. We've been doing DevOps long enough where we know this is fact. So why is DevOps important? Because you have to continuously deliver value. If you don't, you will be out-innovated. And if you get out-innovated, you become obsolete. And none of us want to be obsolete. Hey everybody, it's me, Jay Gordon. I am your host today for yet another wonderful discussion about different DevOps, DevOps subjects. And this week, uh, or I should say this month, uh, I join you with a, a really awesome subject. We're gonna be talking about agile development, how it impacts teams, how to be implementing it into your team, how to do all this interesting stuff. And I've got a really, awesome couple of people to join me today. Um, first of all, I'm going to bring him in first, all the way from the other side of the globe, completely. <laughs> yep. Damien Brady. Hey, Damien, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you, Jay? I'm doing it. And then also from the uh, lovely Pacific Northwest, uh, I'm joined by none other than Abel Wang. Hey, Abel. How's it going? It's going really good. And so I want to remind everybody what we do on this show is we take your questions. We answer uh, what you may want to know about this particular subject. And like I said, what we're talking about this time, it's agile development. So uh, we're going to have some links for you to go to. We're going to have some documentation for you to check out. But I want you to head on over to Learn TV if you're not already and take our poll. And our poll is right up here. It's live now. You can go to aka.ms slash learn TV and you can take the poll today. And I think I'm going to take it right in front of us. Is our team currently practicing agile development? Uh, yes, no, or it's complicated. I'm going to go with it's complicated. Um, maybe it's not. I don't know. What do you guys think? Are we are we doing agile on our team or nah? Okay. Nope. Not. <laughs> but that's because no. we're not a software development team. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. I but you know what I, I do find interesting is we do use some of the elements of, of working in Agile, like as part of our, our work. So we're using work items in a Kanban board, we're we're deciding what's important, we're going through, we're pruning out what's not, we're we're keeping our eyes on the big prize of making sure that we can accomplish our goals. Uh, and, and deliver what we believe is success to our, our viewers. But so we're not so really ahead, doing agile though. It, um, you know, I, again, like you were saying, we're not really a, we're not really a software shop, um, mm -hmm. but we do kind of prioritize our work and we use work items and things like that. But, um, you know, agile is actual is something pretty specific to me, right? Agile, mm -hmm. I think Agile is absolutely vital if you're writing software in a software mm -hmm. project. It's, um, you know, everyone's been jumping on this DevOps train for a couple of years now, just like DevOps this and DevOps that. And I'm going to be that person that's going to step out on a limb here. And I'm just going to say it. I don't, if you're doing software, I don't think you can do DevOps successfully unless you do Azure or unless you do Agile first. <laughs> Well, you know, Azure, that's a whole other conversation Azure, yeah. that we can have. Um, but, but you know, you, you make a great point. Um, Damien, what, what, what's your take on it? Like, do you think we're, we're bringing in those elements? I mean, 
Yeah, I, th- I think um, DevOps is kind of almost just an extension of Agile. I know um, Scott Guggenheimer, who used to work for Microsoft, he um, he always referred to DevOps, and I hope I'm going to quote him correctly, as the second decade of Agile. So you're kind of taking these Agile ideas, which is really just about being reactive and making sure you're not trying to you know plan everything up front. You, you're... you're planning the work that you need to do to to the extent that it makes sense and then fine tuning that work, what needs to happen, what the details are and stuff like that when you know a lot more about it. A similar kind of thing with DevOps, you're you're trying to trying to uh, get value into production, into the hands of users as quickly as possible, but you're not going to do that by saying, right, well, here's the entire plan from start to finish. Um, let's implement this in one hit. You know, you're iterating, you're reflecting on what's going wrong, you're uh, expecting failure you're mm-hmm. reacting to that failure and so on so it's the same kind of ideas it's just extended it a bit so if you're not doing agile if you're doing you know three months worth of work in one hit and planning every work item that you're going to do and then trying to deploy at the end then obviously you're not doing devops because devops is about continuous delivery of value to your end users not delivery hey, of value at the end of a, a sprint you know I, I know that that quote. Yeah. It's a very familiar <laughs> quote. So I mean, yes, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll quickly look up here. These are the the big idea, the big concept that we 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 look at when we're actually talking about where Agile is kind of comes from. The Agile Manifesto, which if you go to agilemanifesto.org, you can get this whole you know series of information. But you know, I I think this is a pretty decent. Um, Definition, but I'm going to let you both kind of give your own. So uh, we 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 are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. And through this work, we're we're prioritizing individuals and interactions over those processes and tools. We're uh, we're working software over comprehensive de- documentation. We're considering customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and that that's a big big deal. And we're responding to change over following a plan. And I think that if we've learned anything in the 12 months that we've all spent on this planet is that planning is great, but you're going to have to pivot sometimes. You're going to have to make other decisions. But anyway, I want to ask you both the first question. You ready for it? Yeah, bring it. (laughs) So how do you and I'll, I'll ask Damien, you, you can go first because you kind of gave some ideas there, but I want you to go first. How do you define Agile? Uh, so um, so my background as well, just to give you some context, I, I did a bunch of consulting um, before I joined Microsoft and before I joined Octopus Deploy. And so I used to go into companies and help them with their Agile um, implementations. And this was... This was quite a while ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, so it was still not not implemented everywhere. Um, and the thing that I found with, you know, what Agile was is it's really about um, kind of reactive software development rather than proactive. And that sounds bad, like proactive is generally a, a good word, but proactive means you have this idea in your head of everything that's going to go right and all of the things that you need to do upfront and this is what we tend to refer to as kind of yeah waterfall model where um, you plan everything up front and then you go through your list and at the end everything's fine and we kind of learned that that doesn't work for most projects not all but almost all projects um, you can't know everything up front so agile for me the way I would define it is writing software in a responsive reactive um, you know, adjustable, changeable, you know, that kind of way, rather than having a, a firm framework of this is exactly what we need to do and we're not going to change it. Um, that's what it means to me, I think. That that really impressive answer, I'm going to be honest with <laughs> you. Mate. Impressive answer. <laughs> but, um, you know, Abel, I want to ask you the very same thing. Um, how do you define Agile? Uh, Agile, like like I said, Agile is very specific to me, right? Agile is a software development process that is highly iterative, uh, that is really important with frequent course corrections. 
Now, how you go about implementing that, that depends on which flavor of Agile you want to adopt, right? And uh, Damien kind of touched on this, but I think it's really important that, you know, we have to understand where did Agile come from? The way that we used to build things is through a waterfall type of process where we spend months and months and months and months gathering requirements and we try to gather the best requirements that we possibly can. And from there, we then build our application, except this, it, the requirements turn into a contract. And we're going to write code, write code, write code for a year, maybe even longer. And by the time we're done, if we follow the requirements, we should be, we should be gold, right? Unfortunately, what turned out is the way that you write software is very different than manufacturing, right? So we kind of got this whole waterfall method from manufacturing because we're really good at manufacturing. And it turns out really bad at writing software. So for the longest time, we couldn't write the right software. It would have too many bugs. It would take way longer than we thought, like not even close. Even if we followed the requirements to a T, we'd end up with software that our end users would look at and just be like, no, that's not what I want. Like, I don't care what I said. That's totally not what I want. It's still not going to work for us, right? So the whole concept of the, the waterfall methodology, it just really kind of falls apart. And so Agile came about and Agile works, well, done correctly. It's like a, a it's really, really nice because it just works beautifully, right? Iteration after iteration, you create shippable units of code that you can quickly course correct. Like I can build a tiny shippable unit of code. My product owner can look at it and be like, that's eh, not quite what I want. Really what I wanted was X, Y, Z. And you know what? You just make the change right then and there. You can do things like not carry debt from one sprint to the next sprint. You can burn down all your bugs. So all of a sudden you're not sitting there with like a mountain of bugs one year into your app where you're like, okay, how am I possibly going to burn down all my bugs? You just do it as you're working, right? So there are so many benefits to Agile. Um, in case you all couldn't figure it out, I'm kind of a huge fan. It sounds like it. And and, and so, you know, I it's interesting. Uh, I, I think, Abel, you and I have kind of talked about this once before, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, manufacturing, huge, huge place in the Toyota Kata book uh, by Mike Rother tends to be a, a real kind of defining piece of um, uh, text that I've found that people who believe in Agile, believe in DevOps, they really turn to this because, you know, the improvement kata is, is, is a really big deal. It's consideration of your vision, it's grasping conditions, it's defining your next target, and it's moving towards conditions iteratively. And I feel like that's really the big idea of DevOps is we're, we're, we're considering what we're doing. We're iterating upon that and not giving ourselves really um, well-defined like specifics. We're giving ourselves some wiggle room in our, our, in our development process. And I think, you know, we've seen, like I keep saying, you know, I said before, 2020 into 2021 has proven that all great plans are, are great, but they can fall apart pretty easily. Yeah, what, what's the saying? Every every strategy um, falls apart with first contact of the enemy, or something like that. I can't, I'm it reminds me of, it, but reminds yeah. me of Mike Tyson punched, so in, punched, in, the punched in the face. Yeah, Absolutely, <laughs> that that's that Mike Tyson yeah. quote. You know what? It, it really always sticks out to me here, and I think it's because. You know, he, he, he put it in very, very simple terms. Everybody thinks they know what they're doing, but when something completely takes you out of your element, how, how do you make up for it? How do you continue? Yeah. And so I, I want to talk to you about our, our next question. Um, and before we get in that question, I want to remind everybody we're taking a poll. We've got some answers so far. I'm, I'm, I'm loving you all taking part. This is huge. Um, head over to Learn TV uh, and, and take our poll. Is your team currently practicing agile development? Yes, no, it's complicated. You know, kind of like a lot of people's dating nowadays. Yes, no, or complicated. It's a weird time. What can I say? Um, and so it, to get into our next question, um, wh what would you say is the big difference between agile and scrum? Uh, Abel, why don't you take that one first? Sure. All right. First, we got to figure out what Agile is, right? Agile with a capital A or Agile with a lowercase a? 
So like Damien and I said earlier, Agile is a software methodology, right? Uh, highly iterative, lots of course corrections, so on and so forth. There are a lot of different flavors of Agile. One of the flavors is Scrum. One of them is Kanban. One of them is Agile with a capital A, right? So that's kind of, that's kind of the difference. I mean, uh, when you're talking just about Agile in general, it doesn't describe the ceremonies that you have to have. It doesn't describe uh, the, the, the different things that must happen, right? That kind of falls into the different flavors of the specific flavors of Agile that you pick and choose. That's very, very cool. And, and so I'll ask you the same question, Damien. What do you think is the big difference between the two? I think, yeah, I think Abel nailed it. Agile, assuming we're talking about just agile software development, is this idea that that manifesto you, you added before where <laughs> it's more important to do things correctly than to do things according to a plan. You know, huge amounts of documentation isn't as valuable as, yeah, awesome. Huge amount of, <laughs> amounts of documentation isn't, isn't as important as working software, talking to customers, being uh, you know available to change things when they go wrong you know this this conversation based thing rather than here's a gigantic requirements document go and do that work so I, that's the idea of it how you implement that can change so scrum was kind of the the really popular one when i was when i was doing mm -hmm. it and um it's just a framework for you know a set of um things that you do and ways that you behave and ways that you manage your work and manage your team that is useful in, you know, becoming an, a team that does agile software development, really. Gotcha. Well, well, thank you very much. And, and so, you know, when you think about these different types of methods, it always comes down to a team. You know, teams are the, the basis of how um, this kind of all comes together. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, and Damien, why don't you give me your answer and then Abel, let's hear what you think. Uh, what's the right size team to start working Agile? I think, I think you could probably even ask this question about what's the right size team to start doing software development or to do software development. I think if you get too many people trying to work towards the same goal um, with the same set of uh, requirements like same set of things that they're working on you get this too many cooks scenario where you know if you have a relatively small code base and 40 developers trying to work on that same code base in the same areas they're going to start stepping on each other's toes um, regardless of whether you're doing agile or not um, agile can kind of help with that a little bit but i still think that's too much too many people i i think the most successful scrum teams i've been in have been six, seven people at most. And then if you have more developers than that, because obviously you're likely to, being able to split that into multiple Scrum teams and looking at techniques like scrums of, Scrum of Scrums and all that kind of stuff, um, as long as you can keep people from stepping on each other's toes, it means that you can have those conversations. There's that really um, awesome, there's that really uh, good uh, idea of, you know, if you have two people in a team the number of communication channels, like number of conversations that can occur is one, like one person to the other. If you have three people, then suddenly you've got three different conversations that can go on. Um, I am not gonna be able to get the maths right, but as soon as you get to four, you know, this is exponential growth. So if you have 10 people in a team, there's mm -hmm. ten, like hundreds probably, I don't know, I'm not gonna do the maths properly, but there's a ton of conversations <laughs> that can happen. It's difficult to include everyone, um, so yeah. I think maybe six, seven is probably the most for doing effective agile. Very cool. What do you think? I agree with Damien, right? Uh, and this is going to be kind of boring because uh, Damien <laughs> and I, we've been working together for a long time and we, we kind of see things as the, relatively the same way when it comes to agile and how to run teams and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, scrum teams, they can run anywhere from as small as you want it. I've done scrum teams of one, just myself, and it worked fine all the way to, I've seen it be successful with 10, right? But then it gets, uh, it, it starts getting to be quite a lot of people. I think a good gauge would be your daily standup, right? A common mm -hmm. thing that I hear is, oh, the daily standups take forever, blah, blah, blah. They shouldn't take forever. They should never take longer than 15 minutes, right? I, I've got to agree, yeah. It is three simple questions. 
What did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What are your blockers? Right? Those are the only three things that should be said. And if there's any side conversations that's going to spawn from this, you know what? Shelve that for another conversation after the daily stand-up. So no matter how many people you have, your stand-up should not be more than 15 minutes. And if that's all you're doing, those three questions, and your stand-up is longer than 15 minutes, you might have too many people. Gotcha. Well, we got a question from Learn TV, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to break it. It's it's a pretty simple question. Um, how does how how does Agile help the actual DevOps movement? And thank you, Ambu. We appreciate your question. I, I I'll grab that if you want. So I think Agile is really useful for the same kinds of principles within a development team. So DevOps obviously is not just the developers, developers and operations and everybody else, you know, the, the name is kind of limited. Um, it should include everyone who, heard, everyone who has any stake in what's ending up in production. But um, those same kind of principles and ideas of making sure that you're reacting to change, you're aware of things that can go wrong, you modify your processes and stuff. At a DevOps level, that involves heaps of people. For Agile, that's your development team, essentially but it's the same ideas. So I think um, if you're not doing Agile, as Abel said earlier on, if you're not doing Agile, you can't effectively do DevOps. Um, so I think implementing Agile within your development teams goes mm -hmm. a long way to, to improving your DevOps scenario. Yeah, I, I, again, I agree totally with that. Um, I, the one thing that I wanna point out is what Agile can do for the DevOps world is your dev teams, now they're able to create shippable increments of software, sprint after sprint after sprint, right? So if they're able to create shippable increments of software, well, guess what? We should have pipelines in place that will take those shippable increments and actually ship them, right? So, so is it important? Absolutely, because without Agile, how am I gonna get that shippable increment of code? Yep, that makes a ton of oh, sense to me. Let me get you at a solo layout. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it and I'm doing it live and I'm doing it on the fly. And we've got a bunch of questions. Cool. Um, and I, I want to apologize to Mariano, who's in the um, in the chat. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a translator today. And so if you don't mind, I, I'd love your questions in English, but we'll look to in the future, try to be able to get more of them just English in your in your Q&A. But I really do appreciate, uh, Mariano, you, you're, you're super part of this conversation today. Um, I will uh, see if I can get these translated and answer some of your questions after the fact. Um, but I do have a question here uh, from Oscar. And Oscar wants to know, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how does it so that developers have no experience in, in Agile methodologies start in a collaborative environment and do not fail in the attempt? And you know, it's funny because I wrote a question out for you that I both wanted you to answer. And, and it sounds like, you know, Oscar really hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, the best way to put it is how do you, what, what, what's the biggest barrier for those teams to start implementing Agile? Yeah, um, I, so I have a bit of experience with this. I know that Abel probably does as well, but I used to go into a lot of dev teams that weren't doing Agile and try to train them to get them, get them set up. I think that the hardest thing with that or the biggest barrier was not quite understanding what the point was. So, mm -hmm. and, and I was a little bit guilty of this. You go into a team and you say, right, we're going to start doing Scrum. Here are all the rituals that you need to do. Here's the exact way you're going to work. And people just start following the bouncing ball. Like they do those things and they're not really sure why they're doing them or what benefit they have. Um, and you get this, this, the common story when you're teaching Agile is this cargo cult idea, which is the story of, and I'm not, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but the story of the, uh, the um, community on an island and they used to get um, airdrops of, um, you know, uh, food and, and supplies and things from the army that was posted there. And so the plane would come over and they'd drop the, the packages with all of the food and all the supplies and so on. And that's what they would see. And then the army left. And so these, these rituals kept going. They tried to get, you know, these, these you know, um, models of airplanes to fly over the top and drop boxes and stuff because that always led to having food. Now, Abel's probably got the actual story in his head and he's listening to me going, 
dude, that is that is wrong. Do some research, man. Um, <laughs> but the the idea is you have this these things that you do, and you're not really sure why you're doing them. So when the consultant leaves, and Agile and Scrum and things like that stop working, then it's difficult to think that you're going to succeed. To Oscar's point, like how do you modify what you're doing to actually start working? Um, mm -hmm. So I think the biggest barrier there is this underlying understanding. Um, and I love Scrum and things like that for a way to get started. But as soon as things are breaking or not working as well as you want them to, you need to know why. You need to be able to identify why and what the original point was in the first place. Um, otherwise, it's not going to work. So that barrier for me is the understanding of why you're doing all these things and what you know why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, I think the most important thing is education, right? You need to educate everybody, not just your developers, not just your PMs, not just your management. Every person needs to be educated on what Agile is, how Agile is run, why it's run this way, why it's important that you need to do things like this, and what metrics really work with Agile. Right, because Agile is completely different than Waterfall. You can't use the same metrics. So you can't just have your dev team be like, okay, we're going to do Agile. And then your management team is still asking, well, what percentage done are you? Um, or, or things like that, right? If they're still using the old metrics and you're trying to do Agile, you're just going to end up in a situation where you're not doing Agile and you're doing Waterfall even worse than before, right? It's just a, a colossal disaster. So everybody needs to be educated. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is you bring in an outsider to be your Agile coach, right? Whether mm. it's a sub master or something else. Um, I think it's very important that you bring in someone from the outside because someone from the outside, they have the leeway to be able to say whatever it is that they want to say to whoever it is that they need to say it to, right? I'm sure we've all been in that situation, right? Where you have a CVP come up to a certain dev and it's just like, I need this feature, write me this feature now. How is that dev going to tell a CVP, I'm not going to do that? You can't, right? And in fact, anyone within the CVP's command chain, they're not going to be able to, to, to be like, no, we can't. But someone from the outside, an agile coach can be, they're able to push back and say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Put it on the backlog, rank it really, really high so that we do it next time, but you cannot interrupt our engineers mid sprint, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's important to bring in that outside person because they have the freedom and the power to be able to make everyone do the, do the right thing. Gotcha. Well, that, that leads me to a, 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 the next great question that we got from the chat. We're getting so many great questions from the chat and I'm, I'm really appreciating everybody taking part. Um, and, and what are the biggest pitfalls for agile adoption? And, and Abel, you, you, you kind of started, so why don't you help me out here? All right, the biggest pitfall that I see is when people start adopting agile, but not really. Right. They okay. use the agile terms or they back in my day was all about scrum. Right. So they're going to use scrum terms. Oh, we have a daily scrum and, you know, we have a backlog and we we follow all the, the ceremonies, but they're still doing things the way that they used to. They're just using different terms now. Right. All of a sudden you're not doing scrum. You're not doing agile. You're just using your same process and doing it really badly. Right. Um, I think it's. Sometimes it's even worse too, right? Because sometimes you get in that situation where you you get people that are like, okay, we're going to adopt Agile or we're going to adopt Scrum or whatever flavor, and immediately they're going to want to be like, oh, but you know, we're we're a special organization, so let's start mm -hmm. let's start changing things up, and they start changing the process before they understand what those what the impact of those changes will be or whether they really even need them or not. So what I usually tell teams is, if you're going to go Agile, if you're going to go Scrum or Kanban or whatever, do it by the book. And do it by the book for a couple of iterations. And after a couple of iterations, when you start getting the hang of it, you get that muscle memory going, you can start mm -hmm. tweaking it and saying, you know what, maybe we can do something else. Because what I end up seeing when people do that is they end up doing just a bastardization of a process, right? They're not doing waterfall. They're not doing agile. What are they doing? It's just a giant mess. Um, yeah, it just it just turns into a horrific mess. So don't do that. So yeah, what do you I, think? Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I pretty much echo exactly what, what I was. 
I've seen this heaps of times as well. Um, the number of people who, or number of teams you go into and they're saying, yeah, yeah, we started doing Scrum. Um, we have our daily stand-ups, but you know, because of our, our situation, our sprints are three months long and you're like, you're <laughs> not doing that well. Like, yeah. You, a lot of people like to be, believe that they're like special snowflakes when it comes to how their process is done in house. But in the end, I mean, a lot of times you're just developing software and using these techniques are pretty tried and tested. And to try yeah. to like one off it and, and, and freestyle the process, it, it seems counterintuitive. Because if we're just freestyling what we think is a development process, we're ultimately not actually implementing it. We're, we're putting in some Frankenstein's monster that's doing just part of what we think is important. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to move on to our next question, and it came from Learn TV. I know I'm getting this hot and, and, and getting them quick and fast, but you know what? That's because these viewers are just so great. Um, and, and so remember, take the poll, be part of the stream, give us your questions. Uh, we, we, you know, these two fellas, they got busy, busy schedules. Uh, and, and so we want to make sure that we're getting the most out of this session. And so the next question I, I received from Learn TV chat is from Hamad. Hamad wants to know, where do you think the future of agile methods leading to post pandemic? So how do you think teams are going to meet? Do you think that things are going to kind of change? Because everybody's so online first now, but people are going to go back to work. Do you think that there's going to be really big changes to how people work, especially in hybrid environments? Yeah, um, as the person on the other side of the globe, as you mentioned, um, I think one thing that the pandemic has has done is made more people aware of, of some of the difficulties of working remotely. Um, and now I, I see working remotely as two separate things. There's working remotely in a time zone adjacent location, which I've got all these terms now, time zone adjacent. So, you know, my 9 a.m. is like your 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. or something like that. But right now it's, uh, what's the time now? It's like 9.30 in the morning for me. So that's not time zone adjacent. So there's a whole different set of challenges when you get to time zones. And I could, I could talk nonstop for an hour on that, so I won't. But it, I think even for the teams that are used to working in the same office, the fact that they're not in the same office and now they're talking to each other using that little block, little box right in front, there's a lot more appreciation for actually working in a collaborative way um, when you're not physically in the same place. And when it comes to some of the things that people do with Agile, like, you know, your daily stand-ups or your, um, you know, code reviews or pair programming and things like that, we've had to kind of adapt to the new reality to be able to enable those things to still happen. And I think mm -hmm. that's likely to continue. I think before, and maybe even at the start of the pandemic, all of those things were just dropped because they're too hard. But as it went on and as everybody stayed home for a lot longer in most places, mm -hmm. um, there's a realization that those things were valuable. We, we need to work out a way to be able to do them when people aren't physically in the same location. So I think post pandemic, I, I'm hoping that that will continue, that it's not going to be a requirement for everyone to still be in that same place to be able to do those useful things. Um, and, you know, the technology's improved. We've got great ways of doing that. Um, VS Code Live Share um, is awesome. Yeah. Code Spaces is awesome. Like all of this stuff is so good for this collaboration remotely. Um, and that stuff Absolutely. didn't exist, you know, a few years ago. I, I spent some time recently with Brian Benz on my other show, Azure Fun Bites, and we got a bunch of time to kind of talk about um, how remote teams are going to work better by using something like code spaces. Um, pair programming alone is important to have a tool like that. But the idea that, you know, we can do um, a better debugging of problems in real time across the globe using the same repository, like that to me is, is so huge. Uh, in, in where we are right now. And so I, I that's a really great question that we got. Um, and, and, and so Abel, I, I've got an, a question that maybe you and Damien can get a little fisticuffs in here because you've both <laughs> been super, super agreeable. And, and I don't mind that. I, I like it when people get along. But Adrian wants to know, so what does the Fireside Chat disagree on about Agile? You two know each other super well. And so, Abel, I'm going to ask you to go first. 
What, what have you two kind of disagreed on in, in regards to Agile? That's kind of a tough one. Um, I don't know. I'm going to need your help, Damien. Do are, do we have some big disagreements on Agile? Uh, you you were mentioning, not big ones, I don't think. You were mentioning um, Scrum as a thing that you thought was awesome. Oh, yes. I have a lot. I have a few reservations about Scrum, mainly the way it's implemented in most places. But um, I, so he, my criticism of Scrum is that I think it's great for getting started, but I think if you're doing Scrum by the letter for like a year and haven't changed any part of it, then you probably don't know what you're doing. Um, and that might be a little controversial and the people at scrum.org are probably gonna hate me now. Um, but we always used to have this term scrum butt which was always a dirty word. Like um, if you're doing scrum, but you know, in our situation, we don't actually do this because it's too difficult. And the examples on scrum.org are, are legitimate. Like um, we're doing scrum, but it's too hard to do the daily stand up because people arrive at different times. So we don't do that every day or we do it every, every week or something like that. Then that's a, an example of scrum, but, and that's a bad thing. And I totally agree. That is a bad thing. But there are scenarios with the real world where you're not doing Scrum properly. And I think part of the criticism of, of the Scrum adherence is that sometimes the response to, oh, we're doing Scrum and it's not quite working for us is, oh, well, then you're not doing Scrum properly. Um, you need to do more Scrum. It's a little bit like the, you know, if your diet's not working, then mm -hmm. um, you're just not doing it properly. You need to do more of it or, you know, it, there's no alternative except to do the exact thing that Scrum tells you. And I don't think that's right once a team understands what they're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah, and I've, I've realized I've started to drift into an area that you're going to be like, no, I actually, I agree with that. So what do you think, Abel? Do, 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 just just <laughs> to be controversial here, I'm going to say I disagree with you totally, Damien. Scrum, cool. pure Scrum is Beautiful. I freaking love it. And actually, I really do. Um, I've led many, many teams using Scrum. And Scrum done correctly is like just a fine move. Like it's, it's like a Swiss watch, right? It's everything just, it's beautiful. It's, it really, really works good. I do understand that you don't need to follow Scrum ceremonies 100%. There are teams that can tweak it, that can change it. However, my thought about that ultimately is if you're just starting out, don't start out that way. Start out doing it by the book, right? Because again, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what works and what really doesn't until you've done this for a couple iterations, until you kind of figured it out. Um, one important thing when I'm doing Scrum though, is at the end of each one of my sprints, I have a retrospective, right? And we talk about the good, bad, and the ugly. And of course, everyone loves the good. Uh, the bad is kind of there, but the ugly is kind of the most important, right? At the end of every sprint, I want to look at what hurt the most. Because what hurt the most, how are we going to fix that? So that for our next sprint, we don't have this problem again. And here is where I kind of agree with Damien that, that the, the pure scrum process can be tweaked a little bit. But again, don't just tweak it for the sake of tweaking it because you can really identify why is it that it needs to be changed what's going to be improved because we made that change right so so i'm not 100 percent against deviating from pure scrum but you better have good reason absolutely and so uh i i've got another question from adrian uh adrian's great 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 person and so adrian asks me and i'm going to pop it in so everybody can see it in the chat um what does the crew here think of the current vitriol so we're going to get a little spicier again um and, and so what does this crew here think of the current vitriol and hatred toward agile as if it's some sort of bane in the industry i i i'm going to just say something quickly i i think that when people drift to the negative over change it tends to kind of permeate teams and it, it, it can create problems in your culture. And I think that that vitriol and hatred towards a process seems misguided. Um, Damien, what do you think? Yeah, I feel the same a little bit about DevOps. So Agile, Abel talked about this before. If you think about the 
manifesto for agile software development in that sentence agile is an adjective it's a mm -hmm. it's a way of doing like it's a description of the way that software development is done um but you can't sell an adjective you can sell a noun so you sell things so agile became capital a and then people go and sell it and i did plenty of this i know abel did plenty of this as well you go and sell your agile services you sell a methodology you you are you are selling a thing that should be about shouldn't be a thing it should be a way of working and so in that respect i totally understand the kind of hatred and vitriol towards agile capital a agile it's mm -hmm. this thing that's often forced upon a team and you know there's the scrum method of this is exactly how you work and this is how it will you know this is how it will go and if it's not working properly you're not doing it hard enough um there's no buy-in from people there's just this is what's happening now. And so from that perspective, I can totally understand it. That said, the ideas behind it and the, the things that it's trying to solve, I think are very valuable. They're legitimately valuable ideas and things that you can implement without necessarily going through, you know, here's the exact process that you need to, to follow. I think I saw a tweet a little while ago about i think it was about scrum basically saying we want you to be a self-managing team who reacts to all changes here are the very specific rituals that you need to do to do that right so mm -hmm. on one hand saying you need to be able to react you need to be able to respond you need to be agile and then on the other hand saying to do that you do these exact things and you do not drift away from those um yeah and i found respect, that yeah really understand i found it. a really great tweet about it uh, i want to just show everybody uh, kind of what, what Damien is talking about is organizations with self-managing scrum teams face the difficult challenge of balancing their autonomy while keeping their work integrated uh, with the, the rest of the organization. And I think that that's a really, really great point. Um, Abel, uh, I, I'd like you to kind of talk about, like we're, we're, we're talking what, what pisses us off about uh, Agile. Why don't, why don't you let me know, uh, like, what do you think about this this kind of dis, dislike for change? You know what? Software methodologies come and go. Uh, it, it, things become popular. Things become not popular. I just don't think it's... It, it's just human nature, right? It's human nature to look at something. There's a lot of people... Um, companies or organizations out there that do Agile so badly it does not surprise me at all that people have a vitriolic hatred towards Agile. If that was my introduction to Agile as well, I'd be like, man, Agile sucks. This is preposterous. Why are we wasting our time doing this nonsense, right? So I get it. So, so I totally get it. Um, but I will say this, Agile done correctly is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, it, it, it's, it really works well. And I don't care which flavor of Agile you use. Again, you can do Scrum, Kanban, whatever, so on and so forth. Um, I did want to point out that last tweet that you showed was, was really kind of cool. Um, because these different Scrum teams, they kind of do have autonomy, right? Or this idea that these, these teams have autonomy. At Microsoft, we ran into this exact same issue as well, right? If you look at the old Azure DevOps team, uh, that was something that we did. Uh, so. To kind of give you a scope, there was approximately 60 of these teams of about 10 to 12 engineers each spread out on the East Coast of the United States, West Coast of the United States, and India, right? So this was spread across the entire world. Um, each one of these teams were autonomous, but how do you keep 60-some teams spread across the globe humming and doing the right things if they're autonomous, right? So they were autonomous, but they we had what was called aligned autonomy. So there were certain things that we did need to align on. So certain things we didn't. So for instance, we did not need to align on which version of Agile were we gonna choose. So of course my team did strict scrum. By the book, Damien. <laughs> I love this, this zombie scrum survival guide too. I, I love the name. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so thank you, Barry. Uh, great, great uh, little tweet there. Um, I, I want to go on to the next question. I, I, I've been really lucky. We've got a lot of new questions from our viewers, and I want to make sure that they get them answered because we've got about 15 minutes left, and this, this goes real fast. Um, so what can you recommend to Oscar to be a good Agile coach? I think uh, Abel kind of nailed it before, that education. Um, 
as I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm sometimes a bit iffy on certifications and things. Um, yeah, you too. But de depending on, you know, how you want to actually be a coach, if you want to be a formal scrum coach, then I think a certification is a good idea. Um, however, if you just want to coach your own team into doing scrum, I think read as much as you can, um, watch as many videos as you can about it. Um, there is a ton of information about how to implement scrum properly. Um, and then agile in general, like there's so much stuff around how to do agile properly, read as much as you can. Um, and then I think to be a good coach, um, just in general, regardless of whether it's agile or anything else like that, listen to the team, um, and actually understand where they're coming from with any complaints or any changes that need to happen and try to respond to those complaints and those, those bits of feedback in a way that matches the things that you've learned, like why you're doing these things. I think those are kind of what I'd say is the key. I think you nailed it, Damien, right? The most important thing is to know why. Why are mm -hmm. we doing things like this, right? Um, and to really understand the whys throughout the entire process, you can do a lot of reading, right? Um, one way you can figure out the whys is to live it. Like you live trying to do Scrum, implementing it badly, failing miserably, repeating it over and over again until you're slowly starting to get better. And then eventually you finally figure out what's going on. So that's one way of doing it. But it takes a really long time with a lot of failures to get there, right? That's kind of how I learned. I don't recommend anyone else do it that way. Read the books, right? Watch the videos, figure out the whys from there. Then you can gain the wisdom without suffering the pain. So that's super, super important. I think another important thing in an agile coach is they have to uh, feel comfortable pushing back, right? Not only do you have to listen to the teams, but you have to feel comfortable enough to push back against the team, whether it's the team that you're coaching or whether it's against the management that's trying to tell the teams to do certain things that you know is incorrect, right? So you need to be able to, you need to be able to handle some conflict, right? Because you're going to be in a role where you're going to be dealing with a lot of conflict. You're going to have a room full of devs that are just going to be like, this is stupid. Why are you wasting my time? You're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of business folks going, this is completely stupid because none of my, you're not giving me any of the metrics that I absolutely need to give to mm -hmm. my VP, right? So you need a, you need to have a strong personality to be able to push back as well. Empathetic to listen, like Damien said, but strong enough to like push back when you need to. Absolutely. And and so you brought up something I think is really, really interesting. And I, I had this question ready to go. And, and it is how do product managers influence the, the agile process? They have their own priorities. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm curious, like, how exactly do they kind of influence this whole process? Um, do you want to? <laughs> they need to be educated. Yeah. They need to be educated on why waterfall doesn't work. They need, mm -hmm. be, they need to be educated on why all of the stuff that they think they need to have makes no sense. The gist of it is we are making up numbers. Like we're pulling numbers out of our butt. We're not, it's not even close. Like, oh, approximately it'll be it maybe kind of, no. We're flat out making numbers up. So if we're making numbers up like that, all the stuff that comes from product management using those old metrics is all completely garbage anyway. So the sooner and the faster you recognize that, the faster we can adopt a process that actually makes sense. That we start using metrics that really start making sense, right? So where does project management kind of fall within all of this? Is there a place for that? There is, but it kind of sits in a different place than it did before. And I'm not saying that they're completely useless, but their role is gonna be different. Gotcha. What do, you, what do you think, Daniel? Yeah, I, I'd say the same thing. I think they can influence it positively or negatively. And it's, <laughs> it's education, yeah, but I think it's, it's buy-in and understanding why and actually acknowledging that the team needs to work that way to be effective. Um, I've been in plenty of places where the dev team really, really wants to do agile, but they still have to give formal estimates and they're held to those estimates, which... <laughs> Is, is pointless like there's there's yeah, no point you're, trying you're to do agile agile when, yeah you're not doing agile anymore so i i think there's there's kind of ways you can you can get around that i worked in a team once where we had a product owner who was incredibly good at managing that um and he would push back very hard 
um, we called him, and I'm going to send to myself because we're live, but he, we called him kind of the poo umbrella or the poop <laughs> umbrella. So like he would, his, his, his biggest superpower was protecting the, his developers from doing the, you know, from getting interrupted by, by what managers would do. And sometimes, you know, management or um, customers or customer representatives would come in and say, I know that you've planned to do this. We want to do this one instead and we need it to do it, need to do it immediately. And Scrum can cope with that. That's fine. But there was never an acknowledgement that that pushed other things out. So one of the things that this guy implemented was we, we still use the big whiteboard with the actual like sticky notes on it, which mm -hmm. I still love. Um, we mm. would get whoever was asking for this thing to be changed. We would write down on a, on a sticky note the new feature that they wanted and hand it to them. So they had to hold it and go up to the board. And then if they wanted to put it on the board, they had to pick something else off the board and put it to the bottom of the backlog. So they had to physically take something else out of the product. Um, and that making it tangible and making it their decision um, was went a long way to kind of getting the product managers on, on board, right? Um, be, before that, they could just tell the dev team, hey, this is a high priority. Um, you need to shift some stuff, get this done. And then you'd still be able to say, well, hang on, you're not doing things on time. You're not doing things according to when you promised you were going to do them. So... Yeah, and different like roles and different yeah. roles have different perceptions of what done means. Let's let's also remind our, our viewers of that. Like done to one uh, someone on a software development team may not be exactly done to someone on an ops team. And so bringing all those kind of ideas together, you know, we're always talking about, you know, bringing everything over to the right after we we've, we've pushed left as hard as we can. Um, and, and, and so I, I find all this really interesting and, and we're down for like our last 10 minutes. And, and so I, I want to uh, bring up uh, a, another question. Uh, we've talked a lot about concepts, but we've got one more question that I came up with. And I, I really want you to know what are some of the best tools out there for onboarding a team into the agile process? And I'll, I'll start with you, Abel. Okay. Well, before I joined Microsoft, my job literally was to help people make the agile transformation using Microsoft tooling. So that would be TFS back in the day, which has now grown up and is now Azure DevOps services uh, or Azure board specifically, right? The work item tracking section. Um, there's a lot of stuff in docs and also in learn that kind of walks you through agile, uh, how you can do that using the tooling. Um, I will say this caveat, uh, and, and I'm sure every single seller in the world is going to hate me for saying this, but tooling is probably the least important aspect of Agile, right? Like, like you showed earlier, we can do all of this with a whiteboard, with sticky notes, and crayons. Right? We, we can totally do Agile, and we can do it really, really well. Does tooling help? Of course it does, right? And, and there are better tools. There are worse tools out there. Um, but again it's probably the least important aspect out of all of it. But of course, yeah, I'm always gonna say Agile board or uh, Azure boards, cause come on, man, I've been working with it forever. Uh, Demo, we've got a, about a good, you know, three, four minutes. If do you have your idea, what are your favorite kind of onboarding team tools to, for Agile? Yeah, for, for onboarding, I think um, I'm, with, I'm with Abel as usual, that um, tooling is probably not the most important. I think, um, I think it can actually be a hindrance if you start to try and use a very complicated prescriptive tool to um, to do your work. On the flip side, they can be really useful for guiding you in the right way of doing things. So for example, if you're using Azure boards and you're using the Scrum template um, and bugs aren't showing up in your sprint backlogs, I'm not sure if this is the case, but you know, bugs aren't showing up in the sprint backlogs, then rather than saying, oh, well, we need to make some changes to make that happen. There's probably a reason that, that that's not happening, um, that, that the bugs aren't showing up. Again, I can't remember if, it, if they do show up or don't show up, but sometimes the tooling kind of guides you in the right way of doing those things. Um, in terms of, yeah, and Finn's comment there, bad tools make the process a painful experience. Yeah, true. absolutely. Very true. So if you can take the tools out of it until you understand what's going on and then add the tools back in, that can be a valid way to go. But if you're not familiar with it and the tools do 
guide you in the right way, they can be really handy. But in terms of onboarding, um, I think the best tools are other people showing you how it works and working with other teams that are already doing it. Um, whatever tools they're using, if they're effective at using those tools, then that can be a great way of kind of getting into it. Um, yes, yeah, awesome. a bit of a roundabout answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Um, so we just got a few minutes left and I want to give you both some time to also give us some updates about what you're going to be doing, what you're doing now, uh, what's coming up for you soon. Uh, but let, let's finish out our poll. What do you say? All right. Yeah. So people, I asked you, is your team currently practicing agile development? And 67% of you said yes. 22% of you said no. That's a pretty good ratio. And and we've got, of course, it's complicated because why'd you have to go and make it so? Um, but, you know, that that's it's, it's great that we had everybody participate. It's interesting to see who has already kind of taken on this process and who's, who's still learning about it. Um, Mariano loves Azure Boards. So um, let, let, let's give a, a big round of applause to our, our viewers today. We had Ihor, thank you so much. We had uh, Amar here. We had all of our questions, Adrian, Hamad, um, all the other people in the chat today. We, we, we've been really lucky, fellas. I think that hearing from the community, having them be part of this, it, it was really great. Yeah, awesome. And this video is online pretty much straight after this, correct? If you yeah, listen. yeah. It'll be right on YouTube. You can watch it from the beginning right here on our Azure DevOps YouTube. Uh, we've got lots of great content there. I know, Damien, you're always putting some interesting stuff up there. And so I know you do something called the DevOps Lab. You want to give me a little bit of info on it? Yeah, and, and it sounds like um, from that description that I'm doing it a lot, Abel has actually hosted it far more than me lately. Um, so yeah, the DevOps lab, it's, it's really, uh, interviews with people who show you how to solve particular problems using, using DevOps techniques and tools and things like that. Some little deep dives, just 10 minutes or so, um, mm -hmm. 10, 15 minutes and yeah, some awesome people who are really good at those tools and really good at those techniques. You know, and I've been lucky enough to kind of be one of your guests. Um, there's a really, really cool series that I like that we're all up to. It's called On-Prem to the Cloud. It's taking a lot of really big ideas about migrations and, and sharing them with our community. But like I said, uh, head over to uh, the DevOps Lab. I put the link in the chat. It's the website. There's lots and lots of content, other videos. Uh, Abel. You're, you're doing all this stuff with me. We're, we're doing the DevOps lab. We're doing things like this. What, what do you got up, coming up? Anything interesting? That's the big thing, right? Um, I've been kind of concentrating on this whole on-prem to the cloud thing just because this is something our customers have told me they have a huge need for, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our demos, the things that we show, we show the latest, the greatest, the coolest stuff in Azure, which is awesome because that's cool to see. But a lot of people are like, you know what? We are not there. We're still running apps on VMs or even on metal, right? Like sitting underneath my desk. You know, how how can we get the benefit of the cloud? How can we, how do we even start, right? Where what's what approaches should we take? So I wanted to make sure we included our viewers that are in that boat as well. There's plenty of content for the latest, the greatest, the coolest. But how can we harness the power of the cloud even for people that haven't made that migration yet? Absolutely. So we're in our last minute. And, and I want to finish up by telling you both, thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, we'll be back again next month. We'll have another conversation about DevOps and the different methodologies, processes, things that kind of make up DevOps. So um, once again, Damien, you're all the way on the other side of the planet from me. Um, I miss seeing you in person. Uh, I, I know I will again sometime soon. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, um, and Abel, I, I talk to you plenty, but I still miss spending time with my, my coworkers and, and the people that I appreciate. And so I'm really also looking forward to, you know, future events where we all get to kind of spend some time together. Definitely. Definitely. I need that vaccine. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm getting jab number two, uh, Sunday. So I'm, I'm, I'm no, no. real happy. So anybody, um, 
Let's give everybody a big wave goodbye and let them know we'll catch you all next time. Thank you so much from a DevOps Fireside Chat. <laughs>